<laughs> so trust everybody had a wonderful Christmas and a and a good New Year's Eve and now we're beginning a new year so happy new year to everybody um, and welcome to Brown Bag Lunch we have birthdays we're gonna say happy birthday our piano players are still having her lunch <laughs> We're going to say happy birthday to Joanne Wetworth. Give me time to get up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, while well, she's getting in place, well, our pianist is getting in place, we have cards going around for Joanne and for a sympathy card for Jack Diets from Clover Ridge. Maybe you need it. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it should come. Can you just send it back around? Just, just start it back around again this way, oh, and then if they sign it, they can just pass it on. That'll work. I think uh, how many of you know that we have somebody else celebrating a birthday? Please raise your hands if you know. Nobody's paying attention. And is popping. <laughs> Bonnie is up here. It says. Uh, first and only. Well, she was the first and only a few years ago. A few years, yes. Yeah, a few years. Ago. Just a few years. <laughs> so let's say happy birthday to our gracious curator. Yes. Thank you. And to Joanne Wilworth. Yeah. And then we will sing to Joanne, you're going to have to be second banana. <laughs> <laughs> but Joanne is not until the sixth. So. so so, what Anne's referring to is us now, everybody knows. Uh, I, I, when I was born a hundred years ago. <laughs> 82. Almost, Only almost. 82. <laughs> So I, I was not the first baby born in Jackson County in our wonderful Jackson County Hospital. I was the second, but the first baby sadly didn't survive. And so I got all the presents, which was probably very nice. But there was never a picture in the paper or anything, which was probably also very nice. No. Just, you know, just out of respect for the other for the other child that was lost. So that was a bad So that's what Ann was talking about. Let's sing loud and clear. <laughs> Raise the rock. <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to keep this a secret until the end. No, no, I'm not saying starts. All the wonderful people that work for Brown Bag Lunch. Thelma Nissen, for sure. Bless her heart, she's here bright and early. Could hardly get in the door this morning because our door has a problem again. Um, and all the ladies that come and help make the coffee and get the goodies ready and the cards ready and the placements on the table and then the ones who take it all apart after it's over. Thank you very much. That's a, that is a big help and I, I probably don't say thank you nearly enough. So, so I just want you to be aware that we have some important committees at work, um, historical society speaking. One is the Hurstville Lime Kilns Committee, and they're doing a great job as we meet um, and just talk about things that we can do there in the way of improvements once spring comes, just to make it a, a safer, happier, more pleasant place to visit and to preserve the wonderful things that we have there. And then also a committee that's meeting weekly for our muster on the Makokata. So everybody has to be sure and save on their calendars for September 6th, 7th, and 8th. 
when we're having our three-day Civil War reenactment. And it's a countywide event that the Historical Society is, is beginning, we hope. We've got some wonderful things happening. Mary and Terry Cregan are working very hard, and Deb Holm, along with a lot of other people. And we have some exciting things promised already. We have General Robert E. Lee is going to be there. And we have, we have for sure um, the Confederacy coming with their cannons. And we hope to have a union group, an opposition group on the other side with their cannons so we can have a wonderful battle on both Saturday and Sunday of, uh, of that weekend. On Friday, we are, we are planning to have a Living History Day, which is a day when we'll invite classes from different the different schools around the county, from Bellevue, from Preston, from everywhere around the county to come. And there will be living historians that will be dressed in costume and doing whatever they would be doing, whether it's cooking around a campfire or some of them will be cleaning weapons, some of them will be sewing, some of them will be just all of the old things that would have been done during that time that, that um, I think our children don't, aren't aware of, are being taught. Don't get to always see. It should be a great, a great uh, learning experience. And we're kind of zeroing in, we think, on eighth graders because they're old enough to, to really soak in what's happening, really understand, and uh, and hopefully learn a lot from this event. So that's our plan. That's what we're going to do. Um, I want to say too, it's Joanne Wentworth's birthday, her 83rd birthday on the sixth. And on Saturday, right here, from 12 to 4, there's going to be an open house for Joanne. And we hope everybody will be able to, to attend. Um, there's also going to be a, a card shower, if you would so desire, and just send it to Don Wentworth's address. He's in the phone book in Preston. So a card shower for Joanne, so that will be a wonderful thing. I want to thank Sue Mayberry for all the work that she's done from for the first time, I think, ever. For the whole entire year of 2023, we have a really pretty accurate account of how many volunteer hours there were. I told you a couple months ago where we were at. I forgot to look up the number this morning. I'm sorry. Um, so I can't give you, but maybe next week. Maybe next week we'll have a the number to post. But please, um, you know, as time goes by, we get more lax about things. Please remember to record your hours. If you bake cookies, all the time you spend baking cookies, that's volunteering for us. If you, whatever you do, wherever you do it, are volunteer hours. And it's so important to the Historical Society. We are asked in almost every report we have to fill out, whether it's for the State Historical Society, whether it's for silos and smokestacks, no matter who it's for, we are always asked, how many volunteers do you have? How many volunteer hours? do have they done during the year and we've always had a really spotty way of recording until Sue took over and she spends a lot of hours. Would you? Okay. Okay. So you'll notice on the sign-in sheet now there's there's been a change to the form so the key will not be on each sign-in sheet it's at the top and it, it has changed a little bit because there were so many hours that were going into the other category. So just wanted to make sure. So if you have any questions on that, let me know. But it's kind of self-explanatory, the key. It's, it's pretty much like it was last year, only with a few more categories added. So Anyway, thanks to Sue, she spends many, many hours doing that for us. And she's just kind of simplified the whole procedure by combining some of the categories. So it's going to be easier for you to do that. So we appreciate everything that you do for us. And I don't think that there's anyone on the board that wasn't completely overwhelmed to see how many hours were being turned in because we just never had accurate accounting before then. So we appreciate that. So those are just some of the things that are going on this year. And... Since this is the first of the year, and I want you to be sure you notice today's brown bag lunch, first of 51, 51 to what is 52 weeks in the year, right? So 51, 51 brown bag lunches 
because we don't have one the week before Christmas. And that means there's a lot of empty Tuesdays that every one of you can help me fill in because everybody has a brown bag lunch in them somewhere. I know they do. And uh, so we, we just need your help. It's, it's fun to hear from a lot of people and not just listen to me or maybe Don or somebody like that all the time. To have lots of, lots of different this? things. So today, because it's the first one of the year, we, we kind of started a, a tradition maybe of talking about um, New Year's resolutions a little bit. I hope, I hope people are still making New Year's resolutions. It's just kind of, no, it's just kind of a chance to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this, this, and this a little better than this, this year than I did last year. But I just think that they're important. Mine is always get organized, and I've been at it for many years now, and I haven't quite made it yet. But I keep, uh, I keep trying it. I think all of a sudden when I stop trying, that that'd be too bad. So I got to keep trying. So I've got to have that New Year's resolution. But so we started talking about um, for for the first one. We started talking about first and only because in a place like Jackson County. There's a lot of firsts, and there's a lot of onlys. And this all came about because of this man. Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember him? I have this newspaper article up here. It, I, it, it doesn't have a date on it, so I don't know when this article was in the paper. I don't know when he was the roving reporter for the Jackson, for the Jackson Sentinel, Everett Strait. Does anybody remember? What's his name? Everett Strait. T R E S T R E I T. Maybe I'll say that right. But you can see his picture there. And he had a column in the newspaper. And so but it's not dated. We just we just have we, we just have one saved and it's not dated. And in that he talked about some of the first and onlys of Jackson County. And then Mike Jones, some of you remember Mike Jones, right? He was a a former Jackson County economic director that just did a lot of neat things here. He kind of picked up on that and he carried it, he carried it on. <clears throat> One of the things that Everett Strait said was, Jackson County owes the beauty of its rugged uplands, limestone bluffs, wooded valleys, and verdant lowlands to the fact that thousands of years ago, when the great glacier, glaciers of the last ice age thrust southward, they inexplicably bypassed a large region that we call the Driftless Area, of which Jackson County is a part, and thus unglaciated lands remain in their primeval splendor, not having been ground into flat prairie. And that's why Jackson County has so many beautiful things to offer, where maybe a little further west it just gets a little flat and monotonous. We have beautiful, beautiful things because of that. And so he wanted to be sure that everybody, everybody remembered that. So some of the things that he talked about in this column, now remember this column was quite some time ago, some of these have changed a little bit, and you may know some of the changes that I don't. But has anybody heard of poverty oat grass? I hadn't heard of poverty oat grass, but this was one of the onlys that Jackson County was supposedly known for. We were supposed to be, because we're one of the oldest counties in the state, we were supposed to be the only county in the state where poverty oat grass grows. And the important thing about that was, I guess, it's a species of grass that grows in very, very poor soil. Now, we don't have poor soil, but sometimes, like during the Great Depression and during the grout, we had very dry soil. And so where some of the more nutrition, nutritious grasses and things would not grow, poverty oak grass would grow. And so farmers supposedly got by by feeding their hungry animals, even though it had very little nutrition, at least it was something that, that they could eat. And so during the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, struggling farmers used that to placate their hungry animals. So when I looked it up this time, it now grows in two or three other counties of Iowa. So we're not the only county, but we were the only county at one time. So. Um, another really important thing that I think an important date that, that we forget here, and this is the Iowa Sesquicentennial Commemorative Painting that Pat, Pat Costello did. 
and it depicts the big land rush into Iowa. And as you know, that was midnight on May 31st of 1833. And that is the time that the United States government designated. No? Yeah, it is. Don say no. But June 1st, midnight June 1st, 1833 was the first time people were allowed back in. The it boats, says the boats launched from the Illinois side before midnight on May 31st. <laughs> So you will find throughout this, there are many discrepancies in the history books. Some of the history books say May 31st. <laughs> so, yes, for June. So, you know, but, but there's all of those, that's right, there's all of those little discrepancies. And so it's hard to talk about these things because no matter which one you point out, somebody's got, uh, somebody's got a different answer. But it was interesting because for months, Settlers began gathering on the Illinois shore of the Mississippi River, waiting for midnight to come, whichever midnight it was, when the, when the race would begin. And they crossed the Mississippi in boats and on barges and even on logs. And once ashore, they scattered out to find the most promising locations in Iowa, all across the Iowa shore. Well, most, of course, went to Dubuque or Davenport or Burlington. And this is because they had roads across the river in Illinois, they had roads going into that area, but there were no roads back then in the Jackson County, coming across the Jackson County area. And when they would look at the Jackson County shoreline, they would see the ruggedness of the shore, opposed to the prairies and things that were further south and further north. And so it just was not as attractive to settlers. So not that many people came here in comparison to the other places. And, and the book said that only the most courageous would take their chances in Jackson County. So, and most of, this, most of this is from the WPA Jackson County, the Iowa Writers Project, WPA Jackson County History. And it does have a lot of discrepancies or things that, things that can, be, uh, can be argued. But this is a wonderful painting. Um, because the, because the Bellevue area was settled first, right? Most people, most people went to Bellevue. They get most of the first, even in, in all of the history books, they get most of the first. The first white settler is said in all of these books to have been James Armstrong, who staked his claim on Mill Creek. Alexander Reed also arrived the very same day in 1833, and Reed built supposedly, the first cabin that same year, three quarters of a mile below the present town of Bellevue. And Reed is said to have plowed the first furrow in Jackson County soil. <laughs> and during the winter of 1833 and 1834, he reportedly killed 75 deer to feed people. Now, that's what the history books say. <clears throat> but according to Jack Dias's and I wish Jack were here with us, in order, and according to his family book, Time Alive, a Dias saga, based on the diaries and the first-hand recordings of all of their family, the David Dias family was in Jackson County, well ahead of all of these other people. It would appear that they came and they crossed under the cover of night. They would cross over <coughs> illegally um, before the May 31st, June 1st date. And uh, they secretly explored the area. They picked out their claims. They laid out their claims. They um, erected a rude cabin that they kept, kept hidden in the timber. They planted a garden. And they, each time they came, they brought supplies. And from the time they had their cabin, they always left a family member there to guard everything. Like I said, they would come and go by the cover of night. They would bring in their supplies. They would hide their boat in the brush so as not to be seen by passing steamboats, not to be caught by the authorities, and trying to avoid the Indians in the area, though they did become friends with a lot of the Indians. But, um, but we do know that the history books are wrong in that case. The diocese were here long before they were supposed to be. Um, then, then when when the time was right and the laws were passed, they could then file those claims that they state and, and have their, their claim to their land. So this is Dutel Howell in Bellevue. And Peter Dutel in 1836 
supposedly built the first hotel in Jackson County. The first schoolhouse was in Bellevue in 1836. Classes were held in a log cabin on Front Street. We don't have a picture of that. Um, J.K. Moss opened the first store in Jackson County in Bellevue. John Bell built the first sawmill near Bellevue in 1836. And the first post <coughs> office in the county was also in Bellevue in 1836 with John Bell as the first postmaster. Um, by, by 1856, Jackson County post offices, and we know this part is true, were more numerous than in any other county in the state. Jackson County had 33 little post offices, where there were 28 in Clinton County, 26 in Van Buren County. Some, as in the case of Jay Goodnow, were in the postmaster's houses, maybe only a shoebox hidden under the bed, like we always hear from Jay Goodnow, how people would just, he was always out working, right? So people would just walk into his cabin, and under his bed was the shoebox or boot box, and they would put their quarter in and pick up their mail, and off they would go. And so that was, that was just kind of how it was done. This is, a, this is a photo from the cover of Susan Lukey's book, The Bellevue War. It's a story of a two-frame structure that was later purchased by William Brown. Allegedly, it became the headquarters for the Gang of Thieves and Counterfeiters of the Bellevue War. And you'll remember that the Bellevue War took place April 1st of 1840. And it was supposedly in this saloon that the very first sermon was preached by the Reverend Simeon Clark. And the first blacksmith in the county was supposedly Henderson Palmer, who was killed in the Black in the Bellevue War in 1840. Um, the first resident lawyer was Henry Hopkins of Bellevue, and he was the one that we talked about when we had our brown bag lunch about print about Platt Smith, because Platt Smith apprenticed with him. And then there's a really funny story about the first doctor in Jackson County. His name was Dr. M. Maws, and he was the first practicing physician in Bellevue in 1836. He rode a mule, an old mule by the name of Joe, and if you ever get a chance in this WPA book, it's a three-page story mm -hmm. about this, and I can't read the whole thing, it takes too long, but it's, it's hilarious. But um, Dr. Moss, who spoke with a lisp, um, rode this mule everywhere he went. That's how he got from place to place. And he sometimes fed the mule buckets of oats. And sometimes for days and days and days at a time, he forgot to feed old Joe. So old Joe would chew his way out of, the, out of, his, out of his stall, out of his little barn, and he would, he would disappear. And he was gone for a while. And so there are all kinds of stories about this, about this doctor. But he was the only doctor around, so everybody went to him. Finally, a new doctor moved into town, and people were saying, Dr. Ma, you better get your act together here because you've got some competition now. Everybody's going to start <laughs> going to the other guy. So um, some, man, some man came in that he treated, and they got into an argument. And Dr. Ma's made him a prescription, and it was for a throat problem, and gave it to him, and the man went his way. Well, because they had had this heated argument, he was a little suspicious of Dr. Ma, so he never took the medication. Mm -hmm. A few months later, he went back to Dr. Ma's and walked in his office, and he just about fell off the chair to see this man standing there. Well, it turns out that the medication that he gave the man he thought was probably just something that was going to be really irritating, but he sent it to Dubuque, and it was somehow analyzed and found to be a really deadly poison. Oh. And so, so he was really glad that he, of course, that he didn't take it. But that's why Dr. Moss was so extremely surprised to see him walk into his office because he thought that he probably was no more. So lots of funny stories about the first doctor in Jackson County. Um, some of the firsts, St. Anatus was the first boys' school, the, the first real boys' school in 1875. St. Anatus also had the first outdoor way of the cross in 1861. And it was the only church, in St. Anatus Catholic Church is the only church in America that is named under Saint, after St. Anatus. And 
in the ways of the only, St. Denatus lays claim to having the only valley, the only creek, the only township named Tedamore, which means heads of the dead. Well, often, and we were talking about all these contra contradictions, often um, Jay Goodnall gets all the credit for everything, right? Especially around Makokota. And I've just read several things here that say that Jay Goodnall built the first cabin in Makokota. But Jay, or in this part of Jackson County, and Jay Goodnall did not. Um, we know that William Phelps, John Clark, and Isaac Mitchell, there's William Phelps, um, John Clark and Isaac Mitchell were the very first white men to ever set foot where Makoka is now located. All these three families traveled here together in a wagon train that arrived in May 27th of 1837. William Phelps filed the first claim in Makoka Township on November 1st of 1838 on land that is now in Makoka's first ward. He filed other claims as well. He even um, north of the Makokota River, including some of the Hurstville area, belonged to him. Um, his family, we know, lived in a tent near the Makokota River, about a half mile from the forks. And his family consisted of William and his wife, four girls and three boys, and they lived in a tent for a, quite a long time, Don, several, many months, through the hard winters, um, until they could get their, get their cabin built. And obviously, we didn't know this, but obviously a lot of people lived in tents here for a long time until they could get their cabins built. So once settled, William Phelps built the first sawmill um, on Prairie Creek or Mill Creek, about two miles east of what is now Makokoda. So back to the first log cabin. The first log cabin must have been built by a really bad dude by the name of Absalom Montgomery. Um, he ended up committee. Don't sit back there and shake your head at me. <laughs> You're dismissed. <laughs> what did I put? So what are you reading then? What, what's the discrepancy? Yes. Thank you. The first log cabin built where Makoka is was built by a fellow by the name of Alfred McGowan. <coughs> no, that was the second one. That's what J.E. Goodenough bought. That's the second one. The no. first. Not, <laughs> according, not according to the records in the courthouse. We, we, you and I had this argument long ago. And we went back through all the books, and this is what we decided. First log cabin was built by Absalom Montgomery, and he's the one that went and knocked on the tent door of William Phelps and threatened him and tried to get him to move off his land, saying he was not allowed to be there. His, his claim was not legal, trying to get him to leave, and he refused to leave and sent him away. The second log cabin was built by three men named Parmeter, Gowan, and Emery, and they arrived here just months after Phillips in the fall of 1837. They got their cabin built second. The follow, and then that following spring of 1838, Parmeter sold this cabin that is the second cabin to Jay Goodnow. So Jay Goodnow did not build the cabin that was at the corner of Main and Platt Street that we call the historic intersection of Main and Platt Street. But it is true that almost everybody who passed through here heading west stopped and stayed overnight at Jay Goodnow's cabin. Um, in 1846, he erected a large brick building known as Goodnow's Hotel. Um, and it became kind of a halfway house between Davenport and Dubuque. And that he built on the site of his old log home where Trout Matthias was, right next door to where, where Marcella had her dolls and doodads on the corner, right next door, right, right there. So um, when Jay and Goodnow settled here, of course, these other people that we've just talked about were here. Most of the history books make it sound like there was no one here. When J.A. Goodnow settled here in 1838, the only family between here and Davenport, between him and Davenport, was the Wheeler family near DeWitt. And then there's the story of how J.A. Goodnow and Lyman Bates, and there was a, a descendant of Lyman Bates here not very long ago, who gave us our first picture of him and, uh, and had a lot of information about Lyman Bates that was really very useful. But Jay Goodnow and Lyman Bates, who he came here with, used horses, and they dragged a load of brush through, 
through the prairie to break down the grass so that they would have a trail so that they could get back from Davenport because there were there were no roads or there were no trails. Um, Jay Gundo, founder of Makokota, he does deserve a lot of credit, but as I say, most of the first um, revolve around him. He did build the log cabin that was at Main and Pleasant Street, that one that we just have a drawing of. Um, it held the first school that was taught here, and the first teacher here supposedly was Richard Steers. Um, it served as the first polling place. Church services were held there. Of course, it was mainly a blacksmith shop. And as you can see, it was well, maybe it, it's partially built underground. Had a so the you'd have to go down steps to get to the bottom. Had a sod roof, and they always had um, pictured it green in the spring. And then it had dandelions growing out of the roof in the summertime. <laughs> and then it turned brown in the fall. So it was just quite an interesting building. And it was kind of a, a center point for, for Makoka in what is now the green space. That's where it was, where the green space is now. So Jay Goodenow supposedly also had the first brick-making business in the county. And he built the first brick schoolhouse in 1842. And it's not one of the big four ward schoolhouses. It was a smaller schoolhouse over by the fourth ward. Um, this is not, this is, this is awesome. The 1872 lithograph of Maquoketa. There's so much to be learned by looking at this map and studying this map. Together with the genies, we have this map reproduced and these maps are for sale for $25. And they make a beautiful, if you frame them nicely, they make a beautiful, a beautiful gift or a beautiful thing for your wall. They're just very, very informative. But as you can see, it has the large <coughs> mill pond that's back, where am I, lost? Back here, the large mill pond that was back there where McCoy's mill and everything was. That's gone now. It was Jay Goodnell's mill, then McCoy's mill. This would be Main Street. And this is just, it's just a wonderful map. But um, the mill, the mill that he built in 1838, mm -hmm. he used it for two or three years. Supposedly it was the only mill um, in Scott, Clinton, or Jackson County, the only flour mill. And it was said that people could come from, from 50 miles around. And there's the story that we've told here before about how Jay Goodnell once worked seven days and seven nights at that mill without stopping. Um, he would pour a bushel of wheat in the hopper as, as wagons were lined up as far as you could see. He would pour a bushel of milk, uh, oats in the hopper, and he would fall asleep on the, on the sacks below him. And he could tell by the sound of the mill when it was almost done, and he would wake up, jump up, and put in some more. And that's how he worked seven days and seven nights without stopping. It would be the change in the sound of the machinery that would wake him up. Um, he did not have a bolting machine uh, to make refined flour, as there was later. He ran the mill for, an, uh, for a year and sold it to Joseph McCoy. And then Joseph McCoy's mill eventually evolved in the Mitchell Masquery Mill. And um, it was just east then of, of Goodnell's cabin. In fact, if you envision the entire east quadrant of the map up here, that was all J.E. Goodnell's. All Dave Goodnell's property was here, this, this whole part of town. And you see where the tree, the tree line lane was. Jay Goodnell planted these trees so he could get back to his timber land for his timbers. So that's that's where he was. So McCulloch's first doctor, much better doctor than Dr. Moss, I think, was um, A.B. Malcolm. He came here in 1840. And before he came, people sought help, medical help, from Thomas Wright. Thomas Wright, as you know, had the, the woolen mills. And he had some knowledge of medicine. He was not a doctor, but he was the only one with any knowledge of medicine at all. And so people went to him until Dr. Malcolm came. OK, William Warren. So the first session, we're talking about first and onlys here, the first session of Jackson County was held in 1838 in Bellevue. William Warren 
um, of Bellevue War fame, built the first bridge in Jackson County. And I've read where somebody else built the first bridge in Jackson County. But the books say that it was a toll bridge and built at the cost of $525. Warren was also the first sheriff and the first tax collector. And it's really interesting because the pioneers could pay, as long as it wasn't to the federal government, could pay whatever commodity um, he would accept to pay to pay their taxes. In Sabula, we know that most of the taxes were paid with coonskins, and Warren accepted them for 50 cents each. Near the forks of the Maquoketa River, the taxes were mostly paid in maple syrup, maple sugar. Um, and then Warren would take the coonskin, the coonskins, and the maple sugar to Galena, where he would sell them. Then he'd deduct his expenses and the amount of the taxes, and then he was allowed to keep whatever was left over, whatever profit was left. <coughs> so, in 1837, the population of Jackson County was 244. The very first official census in Jackson County was taken in 1838, and it showed that there were 881 residents, so the number grew very quickly, and that number doubled again, doubled by 1840. So Amasa Nims and Adeline Goodnow, this is Jay Goodnow's daughter. The first marriage that took place in Maquoketa in 1839 were these two. Um, their son, Wesley Nims, that was born in 1840, was the first white child born in Maquoketa. And Luther Steen was supposedly the first child born in the county. He would have been born in Sabula, February 27th of 1838. Bonnie, is that a typo on Goodnow, or did they change the spelling? Or? That must have been my fault. Okay. Sorry. Well, I know that. But it is it is a typo, oh, you're right. Okay. Uh, sorry. I wasn't trying to criticize. No, I no, <laughs> Nope, I get it. You think I'd see things like that, but you know how that it's is. The teacher in me. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I will get that corrected. Okay, Ansel Briggs, definitely a first, right? In 1846, when, when Jackson County, when Iowa became a state, he was the first governor. He was 40 years old when this happened. Um, and it's funny that the first newspaper in Jackson County was the Andrew Western Democrat. It was the Western Democrat in Andrew. And it's just kind of ironic that Ansel Briggs later, after he was no longer governor, owned that newspaper. Ansel Briggs did many things. He was a surveyor. He was a stagecoach driver, as you know. He had mail routes. He had stagecoach routes. He had lots of things. He was, he was quite an individual. Oops, sorry. Um, before we get to this. The first, the first Jackson County Fair, I thought for sure we had an early picture of the Jackson County Fair, but, but we don't seem to, um, was held in Maquoketa in 1854. It was on a 20-acre site in the area that later became, uh, if you think of where the railroad depot was on East Platte Street, that's where the first fair was in 1854. And in fact, Maquoketa's accommodations were so good that all fairs were held in this all county. All county fairs were held in this city, with the exception of... It's always my children. <laughs> no, where I am, or what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. I know he'll call right back, so... Okay. Sorry. Okay. 1854. 1854 was an awesome year here. 1854 is when um, Jay Goodnell brought the Swigert family into Jackson County and they started their newspaper, at least, the Jackson Sentinel, started in 1854. Lots of things happened in 1854. The, um, the academy, school, many, many things. But the Jackson County Fair started in 1854. <laughs> For two years, it was in Andrew, when Andrew was the county seat, around 1860, and I didn't look that up. Uh, but for two years, it was in Andrew. 
where the fairs were held and then they came back to Maquoketa. I think it's a wonderful thing for Jackson County that we have such a wonderful fair that's been going on for so very long. I think that's a, a real credit. And there's a, a great story to all of that. Okay, so this photo that isn't on there very well because you can't see what's happening at the top, is, which is where I wanted you to look. I don't know what happened to that. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you is, this is Pierce Mitchell's building on the corner of Main and Platte that we were talking about across the street to the north of Jay Goodnow's cabin. I don't think I can move that. Anyway, you, that brick building that's still there today, right? Still there today. It was three-story. It was a three-story building at that time. It's two stories now. But we do know that on the, on the second floor of that building was what we believe, we here believe, was the first bank in Maquoketa. It was in 1856. And that's three years earlier than all of these books say the first bank in Jackson County was. They say the county's first bank was opened in 1859 at Bellevue. We had a bank in 1856 in the Pierce Mitchell building in the front part of the second floor of his building. It was, um, it was called, at first they called it the State Bank, then the First National Bank of Maquoketa. And it was started by Otto von Schroeder, Schrader, Schroeder, Schrader, Schrader, and his brother-in-law, L.B. Dunham. And uh, so do we really know what the first bank in the county was? I'm not sure we do, because we know there were banking houses, right? There were banking houses in various buildings where individuals had kind of private banking where they dispersed money and made change and all that kind of thing. But they weren't uh, certified regular banks. In, eight, in 1861, the Civil War began. Jackson County sent 1,288 brave men. And the first company to go was Company I of the 5th Iowa Infantry that mustered in at Burlington, July 17th of 1861. And the first McCoquitan to enlist was Russell P. Willie. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I, have, I have read many places, many times, that Jackson County sent more soldiers to the Civil War <coughs> per capita than any other place in the United States. And I've read that several, several places. When I asked Google this time, Google said it was California. It was in California. So, I don't know. Things so long ago seem to change today. I don't know how that could be. Okay. So the first railroad in Jackson County was the Sabula, Ackley, and Dakota in 1870, like all the railroads came through in 1870. It passed through Sabula, Miles, and Preston, and then as you see, it went on through Riggs and Delmer and Sprigville. Whoops, that's not exactly in order. Um, Green Island and Browns, but that was the, the very first, the very first one. And we were talking about telephone exchanges. This is, this is um, another first for Jackson County. The first telephone exchange was built by Jackson County Bell Telephone in Maquoketa in 1880. And the first long distance call was made from Maquoketa. And the demonstration of this service was made at the Decker Hotel. They had a great, a great thing at the Decker Hotel and people flocked in to see that first telephone all go through and this photo that I found is just fun it's uh, it's the work crew the, the telephone company crew that um, made all this happen <coughs> Barnes Brothers and Barnes Brothers had been producing electricity in Maquoketa for a long time using a small dynamo and it was in the basement of their machine shop that was on the corner of Platte and Olive Street. So if you remember, that's where the Penrose store was. That's also where Tandem Tire was mostly, lately. Not now, but the last few years. Tandem Tire was there, still there on the corner. So in the basement of that building, with a generator, they were producing electricity. And the city purchased electric power from them enough to at least have street lights in Maquoketa starting in 1893. That was way before most towns had, had street lights. Then in 1895, 
Barnes Brothers built a power generating station at Platt and Clark Street, and I think part of that building is still there. Um, it proved to be too expensive, and so they, they sold and didn't use that. And then, in 1897, the same Barnes Brothers built the first hydraulic dam in the county at Klondike on Makokota River. So if you remember, Klondike is six miles east of here. Um, the dam was made of stone and timber. There was a huge flood in December of the same year, and it washed part of it out, but they quickly repaired it. And because of the thundering waters that came over that dam, it became um, just a huge tourist attraction as people came to see this. They had never seen any, a lot of them had never seen anything like that. It was kind of an example of the industrial age in their own backyard. And so then there, there came fishing and picnicking and boating and all of that sort of thing. It became a great recreation area. Um, they then uh, put a Westinghouse dynamo and a power and transmitted power the six miles from there to Makokota. And by 1908, Barnes Electric Light and Power Company was charging 15 cents a kilowatt for lighting. And they gave discounts to large consumers. But the streets of Makokota were so well lit that it became known as the Great White Way. And this is in a lot of books all over the all over the country, Makokota's Great White Way, because we were one of the first towns to have really effective lighting. In 1909, that was in 1908, in 1909 the first brick paving was laid um, in 10 blocks of the downtown area. We removed it all in what, 2016? In 1917, um, we got our first motorized fire truck, before they were both with horses and with men. <coughs> The first uh, Jackson County Historical Society was organized in 1903 in the insurance office of J.W. Ellis, and our present historical society began in 1964, and Grace Hallahan was the first curator. Another first that we have is Carolyn Pendray. She's in our Hall of Fame, and she was the first woman to serve in the state legislature she was a state representative from 1929 to 1932, a state senator from 1933 to 1936, making her the first woman to serve in the Iowa House or the Iowa Senate. She was also the first woman in the nation to be elected to, the state, to a state senate and the first woman to provide over the Iowa State Senate. She sponsored two women's rights bills, important to everybody, every woman here, giving women the right to own property. Before she sponsored these bills, women could not inherit their husband's property and to be heads of households. And if you remember any of their history, her husband managed the Graham store, and that's why she ended up coming to Makokota. She bloomed where she was planted. So she was quite, and if Roger Stewart were here, he could tell the story of how she built, she, in the election, she beat his great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, Howard Tabor. Howard Tabor, right? And it said that he was so distraught that he stayed in bed for three days. A woman, a woman had beat him in the election. So she was, she was quite an awesome, awesome person. And we have Katie. Katie Phillips that everybody knows. Um, he was the, uh, worked at the post office and he's the one that kept the list of over, it was actually 1,008 spellings that he collected, misspellings of Makokota during his time at the post office. Um, you remember, Makokota is an only, it is the only city in the world with that name. Uh, first it was Goodnow Mills, then in 1842 it was changed to Springfield, then the United States Post Office objected because there were too many Springfields, so it was changed to Makokota, and uh, so Makokota is, is one of a kind. And then I have to end with telling you two one and onlys, okay? Uh, Jackson County has the only set of four restored lime kilns in the country. And our lime kilns are very, very special. And we also have the <coughs> only restored, the only remaining narrow gauge railroad depot in Iowa. There's a couple others that have been made into houses and things like that. 
This is the only restored narrow gauge railroad depot in Iowa. So the Historic Society is really proud to have these two things. I think everybody should remember that. So, good, bad, or indifferent. Those are some of the first and onlys. And like I say, there's lots of, lots of places that you can read that you'll see it says something different. But in, it's kind of the consensus of most things. Does anybody have, I, I know there was one that um, the, the world's, the nation's, the nation's largest cherry tree was um, up in Brandon Township. But that was quite a long time ago. I don't know if that, that huge, huge, famous cherry tree still exists or is still there. Must not be because we haven't heard much about it since. So there's, there's many things that you can be, be the first of. But, but we have a lot. So I hope that everybody will be very proud of their city and very proud of their county <coughs> because it's a really neat place. So thank you very much. And just remember, there are 50 50, 50 more Tuesdays in 2024, and there's a sign-up sheet at the desk upstairs. <laughs> Thank you.